Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sheena Riley, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Health Group. And on behalf of the Health Group and the University, uh, welcome to this special lecture. Uh, very much looking forward to um, hearing from Trish this morning. Having spent a few hours with her yesterday and today, um, I can hand on my heart say we're in for a treat. Um, I've certainly had a treat spending time um, with her the last few days, and I'll formally introduce um, uh, Trish in a minute, but I wanted to begin just by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Any of you who um, have a social media account will know that Trish has been doing the rounds of some of our capital cities and we were really delighted um, to convince her to stop here at the Gold Coast on her way up to Brisbane. Um, and Sharon Micken and I, where are you Sharon? Um, both um, immediately emailed Trish when we knew she was going to be in Australia and said, you have to stop at the Gold Coast on your way to Brisbane. We happened to know that she was driving from Sydney. And she agreed that she'd do this little detour before she headed up to Brisbane. Um, and already we've had some fantastic um, interactions with um, Trish. You will have all received the flyer, so you will have read many things um, about Trish. Um, but just a few words of, um, of introduction. Um, Trish is um, Professor of Primary Care um, at Oxford University and a Fellow of Green Templeton College at the University. Um, her research I find fascinating and interesting. Um, it takes a different approach. She combines the social sciences with medicine. Uh, any of you who follow her on Twitter will know that she's also highly political and very challenging um, and a wonder um, to follow both in her writing uh, but also um, in terms of her social uh, media presence. I honestly don't know how she fits into her life all the things that she does. Uh, but she's written, um, she's authored over 300 peer-reviewed um, papers, puts most of us to shame, 16 textbooks. She has a new book coming out about breast cancer um, later this year, which we're all uh, waiting to see um, uh, appear on the shelves. Um, and without further ado, I would like to um, welcome Trish to come and talk to us on this very important topic of evidence-based healthcare in a post-truth world. Thank you, Trish. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sheena. And, and can I thank you in particular, but everyone at Griffith for making me feel so welcome and also for paying a contribution to my effort, which was, which was really very, very um, welcome indeed. Um, and thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, so evidence in a post-truth world. I, I wrote this lecture for the Global Evidence Summit, which was held in Cape Town a few months ago. Um, and I was asked to cover the topic of vaccines, which was a particular problem for sub-Saharan African countries where, you know, whole programs of vaccination were being rejected by, um, by, by the population. And it, it wasn't a topic that I was particularly expert on. So I just put the subject of, of um, you know, vaccines, anti-vaccines into Google and I got these images which I think are absolutely striking. Uh, and I'm going to come back to these images in, in a bit, but I, I thought, you know, it doesn't really matter which topic you pick, um, stick it into Google and you're going to get a lot of misinformation. Um, and, and, you know, if you're not an expert in assessing evidence, you know, what, what, what do you believe? Um, Tuli Madansela, who's an advocate in, in South Africa, put out this tweet a few months back now. She said, for people who want the truth, adequate evidence is enough. But for those who don't want the truth, overwhelming evidence is inadequate. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting text to start with because it then kind of takes us to the question of, well, hang on a minute, how, what do you mean people who don't want the truth? Um, well, let's just start off on vaccines with 
Andrew Wakefield. Now, many of you are going to be familiar with this story. It's it's pretty old story now. It's been around the world. Um, there was a paper now retracted, published in the Lancet, which linked the um, giving of, of measles, mumps, rubella, rubella vaccine in a combined triple vaccine to the to the development of autism, and. You can see Wakefield there standing with that slightly misty-eyed uh, look about him. I believe there's a causal association, etc. And this rather chilling picture in the bottom right with Wakefield at the head of a procession of parents holding placards, we are with Wakefield. Um, is that, oh yeah, something's funny on my screen, but never mind. Okay. Um, if you want to read more about the Andrew Wakefield story, there have been some extremely good books written about it. And I'm not going to go into detail about that now, but suffice it to say that this was a fraudulent piece of science. Wakefield knew what he was doing uh, and still knows what he's doing, I think. And he's still leading this anti-vaccine movement in America. And now he's actually got Donald Trump on board, which is, you know, quite scary. Okay, so that is a, that is a, a sort of um, amuse-bouche, if you like, for, for, the, for the main um, talk I wanted to give, which is to look more generally at evidence in this world where post-truth seems to be the currency. And, and I'm going to ask a total of five questions. And the first two I'm going to talk about is, first of all, what do we mean by evidence? What is evidence? And secondly, how does evidence persuade? Now... A few years ago, um, I was involved in a project called the Evidence Project, project um, funded by the Leverhulme Trust, and, and we produced this book, Evidence, Inference, and Inquiry. Uh, and in it, Professor David Shum, I know you've got a David Shum as well, this is this American David Shum, spelt differently, I think, proposed a substance-blind theory of evidence and in it, he said that there are three questions we might ask of any piece of evidence from any topic, uh, any field. To what extent is it credible? To what extent is it relevant? And thirdly, what is its probative or inferential force? To what extent does it make that crucial link in the chain of reasoning, which is the one that we are concerned about. And I think that's, that's quite nice, really. It's, it's very theoretical. It's very hypothetical. Um, Nancy Cartwright, who was um, part of, she's a professor of philosophy in the UK, and she was part of our evidence project. Uh, and she actually turned, she wrote a chapter in that, that evidence book, but she turned it into a book of her own. Um, she was interested in evidence for use in policy making, and sh she was particularly focused as a philosopher on science in use, the practical use to which evidence might be brought, uh, put uh, in the policy-making context. And she adapted Shum's questions and asked these three questions. In what circumstances, in what particular circumstances, is an evidence-based evidence claim credible? In what circumstances is a particular credible claim relevant? And then this $64,000 question for, for anyone who's ever worked in a policy context. How should we assess a mixed body of evidence that has varying credibility and is relevant in different ways? Of course, your systematic reviews and meta-analyses are relevant. So is personal testimony. So is the availability of the budget. So is the strength of feeling around the table about different priorities. And, and we juggle those in the policy-making uh, arena. Okay, let's just think a bit about how evidence persuades. And for that, we go back to Aristotle, many centuries BC. Uh, he wrote this wonderful book um, on rhetoric. And he said that evidence is only one component of the art of persuasion. Two other components are the credibility of the speaker, what he called ethos, and the appeal to emotions, pathos. And what and Aristotle used to teach rhetoric as an academic subject. So the idea that um, you know the, the second two are just spin and we should strip them away and just have this pure nugget of logos, uh, that wasn't the way the ancient Greeks looked at it. They'd say scholarship is about all three of these things: logos, ethos, and pathos. And you could say uh, that perhaps we're in the post-truth era. 
the logos bit of that triangle gets so diminutive that, that we can actually sort of discount it altogether and we're talking much more about who's the speaker and what's the appeal to emotions. Now, one of my favorite books on policy is this book by uh, Gian Domenico Magioni. I hope I'm saying his surname right. Um, Evidence, Argument and Persuasion in the Policy Process. Uh, he says, as politicians know only too well, but scientists too often forget, public policy is made of language. Argumentation, he said, is the key process through which citizens and policymakers arrive at moral judgments and policy choices. So this is not just about the evidence sitting there, it is about framing an argument which supports the moral uh, superiority of one course of action over another one in a particular context. I'm going to show you some pictures of Hampstead Heath now. Uh, these pictures were taken by a colleague of mine, Janet McDonnell, who's now, I think, um, Dean at Central St. Martin's School of Art and Design. But at the time, she was a computer scientist working with me at UCL. And we were trying to um, get, a, get a neat little story that would emphasize two people who'd been brought up in the evidence-based medicine movement um, about what exactly the, um, what, what did we meant by policy, public policy is made of language. So what happened a few years ago, um, well for centuries we've all gone swimming on Hampstead Heath and it's been free and there's a men's pond and a women's pond and a mixed pond and you can go there and you know go into the changing rooms and put your swimmers on and leap into the water. The people are absolutely furious about the idea of paying one pound to go and swim in the pond which had always been free for centuries and my grandmother swam in this pond and all this kind of thing. And so look at the arguments that people were using and these are taken from letters uh, written to the local newspapers. Ponds are like the air we breathe. Access to nature is a fundamental freedom that should be open to all. Swimming in ponds is like walking on the heath. Okay, so the authorities came back with their letter to the local newspaper and said, swimming facilities are like tennis courts and bowling greens. They're subject to health and safety legislation, like other public recreational areas. So, let me show you the two competing narratives or competing framings that we have in this pond argument. Note that nobody is presenting uh, incorrect evidence. Both sides are using facts, and that's the point. On the one hand, those who are arguing that swimming should be free are likening it to other things that are also free, breathing the air. They're making the point that the pond is natural. It's not like a swimming pool. Um, and they're using a rights-based approach. It's a right to jump in the water. The other argument is likening the swimming or likening the pond to other leisure facilities and emphasizing that the pond requires maintenance. Uh, hence, it isn't natural. So, um, well, let me just go here. So, this is to um, illustrate the idea that policy making needs facts. But actually, the argument is something more than the facts. And also, which facts are you bringing to bear? You know, it, it is a fact that people pay five pounds to play tennis. But it's an argument to say, well, you ought to be able to pay a pound to go swimming. See what I mean? Okay, so that's a really important uh, uh, thing about, about argumentation and persuasion in the policy process. Now, fast forward 1,500 years, no, 2,500 years after Aristotle, and you get Kim Perelman's book, The New Rhetoric. So he's also talking about logos, ethos, pathos, all that stuff about argumentation and framing. But he brings in... Uh, something more. Think not just about the speaker or the writer, but also about the audience. And before I spoke today, I was asking Sheena, come on, what's my audience going to be? Where are they gonna, what, what are they going to be walking into the room with? What's their baggage? Um, and what Perelman says is, in order to pitch a persuasive argument, you need to know the points of departure of your intended audience. And points of departure meaning the things that you are so sure of that you don't even know that you know them, if you know what I mean. They're so obvious to you that you do not question them. 
my mother-in-law would say that the doctor's authority is completely unquestionable. You would never question the doctor's authority. And that's her point of departure. Uh, so I can't walk in there and say, I think that doctor that you saw didn't know anything. You, it's no good saying that. Um, so, so understand your audience. Okay, we're going to go back to that. Um, the post-truth world is quite a sinister world. And those of us, I should think everyone in this room, has some kind of respect for scientific evidence. Um, the post-truth world is where we've had enough of experts, where I believe, therefore I'm right, is the, um, is the mantra of the day. Uh, that is troubling, as we'll come back to. So let's just unpack the whole notion of post-truth. What exactly do we mean by it? And I think one of the, the best... Uh, paragraphs on post-truth uh, is this, written by Evan Davis, who's uh, both an economist and um, uh, a sort of radio presenter in the UK. Um, he, he subtitled his post-truth book, Why We've Reached Peak Bullshit. And he says societies are particularly vulnerable to temporary epidemics of credulity when people stop caring about where the evidence lies and instead ask, Whose side is the communicator on? And you can see this shift from logos to ethos. Um, the post-truth era came at a time of unusually extreme division and tribalism in the West, the anger at elites, the rise of identity politics. And I think this is a particularly economic thing as uh, money gets concentrated more and more in the hands of a very small sector of society, leaving the rest um, with less and less. Uh, and then people are kind of saying, well, hang on a minute, who are we? We, the disempowered, um, we, those who don't have jobs or whatever. Uh, James Ball in the UK, another uh, post-truth book, which also uses the term bullshit. There's lots and lots of these books around now. Um, looks at um, the systematic manipulation of audiences using big data and social media. And now with all the stuff coming out in the news about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, um, this actually happened. Uh, and actually there's been a number of books setting out in hypothesis terms what people thought was happening. And I think now the evidence is accumulating that it really did happen. So logos, in other words, the facts of election claims, you know, they didn't bother with those. What they did do was they brought the strong leader or someone who could be presented as a strong leader and also the appeal to emotions. Now, this was quite an interesting one because they used very sophisticated audience segmentation to identify particular target audiences and they would then shape a message uh, to those audiences. Um, Someone was uh, telling me, you know, you know this, the credit card you use or, you know, when you do your online shopping um, and you think, well, really, does it matter that I buy orange juice and muesli and I don't buy any meat? But actually, what that does is that that um, paints me into a demographic of, your, you know, your middle class vegetarian, health conscious, whatever. And that means that the messages coming in my direction are going to be shaped in a particular way. But the unifying myth the unifying slogan was made to make America great again. Um, Matthew Dancona, uh, another UK-based writer, uh, this is a good book as well. Um, what he's saying is that the highly irrational and emotionally driven responses to some of these political campaigning uh, approaches are very much exacerbated by uh, what's known as the digital echo chamber. I follow people who are like-minded. I don't follow people who I disagree with. Well, I, actually, I do, but, you know, in, in general, people don't. Um, the secret algorithms that pump news into our social media feeds are designed to give us more of what we like, to bolster our existing convictions rather than challenge them. And actually, that is highly problematic, and you know that as an academic. What you want when you present your work is someone to challenge and say, really, have you analyzed your data properly, or that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and that's helpful. Uh, but this is, this is uh, troubling. Okay, so to go back to Wakefield, and really this emerged before social media was particularly big, but uh, what we had in, in the popular press was contested scientific framings of the autism issue, um, they were placed in the public domain and, and they were, that led to a sense of doubt as to whether these, this triple vaccine had caused autism. And although 
the scientists were arguing about the detail of the epidemiology. They weren't really arguing about the fundamentals, but that led to a loss in, of trust in experts. Um, Wakefield, who had very serious personal conflicts of interest, he was making a lot of money from, from the lawyers, uh, for, the, for the parents of vaccine-damaged children, um, he then created this uh, very simple, very consistent narrative, including himself as the leader of a movement. And you can see how happy he is there at, at the front of that movement. Um, now if we look at the, the anti-vaccine meme again, and these pictures I showed you right at the beginning, um, I'll just let you look at those for, for a couple of minutes because we, we can now begin to unpack the argument, the rhetoric behind this. Um, and I think it's on the left here that scientists are bad people. You know, they wear those white coats which marks them out as evil and they want to experiment on your child. Um, that vaccines as a group are highly toxic, they're contaminated, they're unnatural. Refusal is free choice. It's a very healthy thing to do because it stops all those poisons getting into your child. And of course, <coughs> Wakefield himself, it, it cares very much about your child. He's a good doctor. Now, the conventional public health narrative is not often put forward as a narrative. That's the point. You really have to extract this. Um, the, you know, it's, you can read it there. Infectious diseases are, are potential killers. Um, the, the, the vaccines that are on the market have an outstandingly good benefit harm ratio that refusing to have your child vaccine, vaccinated not just puts your child at risk, it puts the whole population, all that herd immunity stuff, um, and that Wakefield actually isn't a doctor at all. He was struck off by the General Medical Council. So what we have here is a myth on the left uh, for the gullible, and I use gullible, you know, uh, I'm carefully selecting that word, uh, you know, it's ethos and pathos, but actually the, the logos is there on the right, but there's not a clear story unless you systematically pull it out. All right, let's look at two more things. Um, the fourth theme I want to cover is post-truth as grand narrative, and the fifth one is post-truth as vice, um, just vice for the end of the lecture, why not? So if we go back to the person who first talked about grand narratives, it was a French philosopher, Jean-François Lyotard, in 1979, wrote a, a very short monograph called The Postmodern Condition. And you know, he's the one that came up with the term postmodernism. And what he said was, in the past, society was pulled together by grand narratives which appeared to explain almost every aspect of our existence. Catholicism was one very dominant grand narrative in France. You know, Marxism was another one. Feminism, I was a teenager in the 70s and everything was to do with gender. You know, you could, you could frame absolutely everything. In, in the, the trouble is that, as Lyotard said in this his little book, the late modern world is actually more complex than that. There's all sorts of narratives going on and we can coexist in many different narratives which in a way are incommensurable with one another but that's actually what we do. We develop an identity that is a bit of a bricolage of different narratives and so our identity is, is composite, it's multiple. Uh, and actually Leotard didn't see a problem with this but he said you know, we've got to, to recognise that that's the way society is. Um, another um, important influence I think on this kind of thinking was Ulrich Beck who's a German sociologist, wrote a book in 1992 called Risk Society. Um, the late modern world is characterized by all kinds of risk uh, and risk management, if you like, is, is, is the way we deal with the hazards and insecurities that are both induced and introduced by modernization. Um, and he divided the people, the, you know, society into the people who, who can manage risk and the ones who can't. The ones who can manage risk are the ones that succeed in life. Um, you know, they get the good jobs, they get the money, they, they, they're the ones that stay healthy. But the ones who can't handle these multiple different risks um, are the ones that are going to end up, you know, on the social scrap heap, 
unfulfilled, unhealthy, with mental health problems, physical problems, etc. Now, I just wonder whether those, um, the, the population that, that Beck defined as the ones who can't handle risk are the ones who, who are most strongly seeking the grand narratives of identity politics um, to, to give them, to give them a, a, something they can grasp onto. Alex Evans, uh, American journalist, I think, uh, wrote a book called The, the Myth Gap, uh, which is really saying the same thing as Leotard was saying in 1979, but sort of updated that, that, that again, we were brought together with, through these myths um, that gave us a sense of identity and purpose. Um, so, says Alex Evans, the gullible are vulnerable to these new stories about who they are, but they want to be a we. All of us have got this story. Um, especially when those narratives are perpetrated by these charismatic and strong, strong in inverted commas, characters. As one of the things that the Cambridge Analytica um, data was showing very early on in Trump's election campaign was that the American public wanted someone strong. Um, and they were tested out with pictures of Putin, who, who was seen as strong. Um, Mark Thompson um, was British, lives now in America, and he wrote this, uh, I think it's one of the best books, What's Gone Wrong with the Language of Politics. He talked about Davos Man, and I guess he meant Davos Woman as well. You know Davos, where you go, that place in Switzerland, where you go skiing, and, and, and the World Economic Summit happens there, and, and I should imagine it's probably the most expensive place to stay in a hotel, that kind of thing. And, and he actually, I love this character Davos man, the sort of person who might get into something that's happening in Davos, some kind of elite, be it business elite, academic elite, whatever it might be. Um, and he said, why is Davos man deaf to the legitimate grievances of ordinary people? Um, ordinary people being the people who would never be able to, um, well, they wouldn't get invited to Davos, but they wouldn't be able to afford to go there. Um, now, um, what Mark Thompson said is that rhetoric, all that argumentation stuff, is not just about crafting a persuasive story. Come back to Perelman. It's also about listening to the collective stories of key target audiences. What are their points of departure? Let me just finally uh, introduce you to a book written by a friend and colleague of mine, Kasim Kassam, who's professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick. He wrote this book called Self-Knowledge for Humans, which is a sort of philosophical title. But the reason why I like it is he takes Aristotle's notion of virtue and vice, um, and he applies it to um, our intellectual behavior. So I, I used to teach my students about professional virtues, but actually the intellectual virtues are the kind of things we want to inculcate in our students aspects of mind that promote effective and responsible intellectual inquiry. If we, if we haven't got that, we can't get to first base, can we, in, 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 in teaching anyone anything. Things like open mindedness, conscientiousness, criticality. Um, intellectual vices, says Kasim Kassam, are traits that inhibit effective and responsible intellectual inquiry. Rigidity, dogmatism, Evidence complacency, denial, um, and actually in Michael Gove, we've had enough of experts. This is what's, ha what's happening. We do not want uh, responsible intellectual inquiry anymore. I would say that these self-styled leaders like Gove are exhibiting intellectual vices themselves, but also seeking to foster those vices in others. This is a very malign influence uh, on politics and society. So let me sum up. Evidence, I've said to you, is only one dimension of any argument. I've talked to you about the myth gap in late modern society, which has been filled with what can only be described as bullshit, often crafted by people with hidden conflicts of interest. It's, the question is not whether the bullshit is true or not, because people don't necessarily believe it. It's about the extent to which that bullshit connects people up and builds a sense of being part of a tribe, um, a sense of identity. Now, one underlying driver for that um, 
is the fact that, that the common man and woman is no longer listened to by the elites. The elites just do not understand the position of those individuals, and there's a lot of them, and each of them's got a vote. The leaders of those movements are systematic, systematically manipulating public opinion, but they're also trading in intellectual vices. Um, and they're doing it not just through social media, but, but that's, a, that's a big influence. So what can we do about it? You want the answer? Well, I don't have a magic answer. Um, I think I've probably presented enough evidence to, to persuade you that every, every topic, every evidence-based topic, needs a charismatic orator. And, and uh, my colleague Judith Green from London School of Hygiene um, once wrote this, I love this quote, evidence doesn't speak for itself, but it must be spoken for by someone with credibility. That scientists need to understand that there really isn't such a thing as a neutral fact. All facts are value laden. They have to be framed and fitted into the narrative. Think about the Hampstead Pond argument. Um, thirdly, that if we don't ride the tiger of social media, it's going to ride us. If you don't fancy getting on Twitter, you can do what some of my um, <coughs> colleagues at Oxford do. They, they, I, I've got a colleague who's got a Twitter butler, um, someone who gets on social media with his name on it, and he says, put this out on Twitter for me. I don't know. I, it's quite an interesting, interesting metaphor, isn't it? Um, we, we're all really interested in public engagement. You know, it's a big thing now. Apparently, you've got a dean of public engagement. That's really nice. Um, it's not just about what you tell the public, it's also about listening to them. It's also about grasping where the public are coming from, um, even before you try to put any message out. And finally, I, I think this idea that you know, we're the academics and everybody else is, is somehow kind of tainted until we kind of sprinkle our facts like fairy dust, it doesn't work like that, that, that our patients the lay public, journalists, are all our, our potential allies. We need to be working with these groups to help create grand narratives um, and couch our evidence within those grand narratives. Dan Fagan, who's a professor of journalism at New York University, um, talks about how he teaches his journalism students to use different formats, different genres of storytelling in getting the message across. A tweet used to be 140 characters, now it's 280. It's not many characters. On the other hand, maybe the 5,000 word Lancet article is what you want. Maybe it's a blog, maybe it's something else, your policy briefing, your 1325. We need to become skilled at telling stories in all those different formats. Brett Davidson, um, who, you remember that, that quote from Amanda Seller at the beginning, this was taken from this article by Brett Davidson, Storytelling and Evidence-Based Policy, Lessons from the Grey Literature. It's a great article, I'd very much encourage you to uh, get hold of that because it gives you the evidence base for storytelling um, when one's trying to influence policy. So. Thank you for your attention. Sorry about the technical hiccup. I think we managed to ride that one all right. Um, tweet away. Uh, ask questions. Thank you, Trish. Um, and now we have the luxury of plenty of time for questions. Doesn't happen very often. Um, but thank you. Um, so I'm going to throw it open to the floor, but first I definitely want a butler to do my You want tweeting. a Twitter butler? I absolutely, <laughs> that concept is fantastic. <laughs> Here's the message, tweet it for us. Questions from the floor. Um, what we might do is um, ask you to say your name and then we'll repeat the question because the lecture has been captured. So we want to make sure that um, anyone linking in later will actually hear the question. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, as an academic, I have Can you just say your name? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, the, the point of question is obviously uh, this, obviously, uh, not the logos. The ethos is fine. But the pathos, uh, I feel a bit of attention with my academic role in telling truth. Um, 
how should we deal with that? And I've always seen that the two roles of, of fact-finding, basically, and advocacy as two different ones that are sometimes hard to combine. Should we be those advocates, or um, should mm. there be others? Interesting. I'm going to gender this. Um, I not long ago wrote an editorial for the British Medical Journal along with four women and we presented a lot of facts and we also pulled an emotional thread through it to say this must, you know, we'd like this to happen because people are going to die if it doesn't happen. And um, a man, a male professor, actually from Australia, but that's irrelevant, wrote in and said this was irrational and emotionally driven but didn't engage with the facts that we presented. Now, it is traditionally a, and I'm putting male in inverted commas, um, it is a traditionally male approach to say that a, an objective and factual and scientific analysis of anything is not emotionally driven. And I would encourage you to read uh, the work of Martha Nussbaum, particularly a book called Upheavals of Thought, the Intelligence of Emotions, because in that, Martha Nussbaum uses uh, feminist philosophy or post-feminist philosophy, whatever you want to call it, to say, actually, that it does not detract from the rationality of one's argument to appeal to emotions. Far from it. We do certain things as scientists because we care about it. I was talking to David yesterday, who I don't think is here, um, Nancy said he wasn't going to be able to make it, about his research into stillbirth. And you're not telling me that someone who's grown up as an obstetrician delivering babies is doing research into stillbirth in, in a way that is detracted from the fact that he's actually had to tell mothers that their babies died. In other words, one of the things that has driven that program of work is the fact that he really cares about reducing stillbirth and that that, you know, maybe emotionally, I don't know if he's not here, but, but that's just an example that, that, that was topical for me. Um, the evidence around vaccines, again, I would say, uh, I, actually a colleague of mine, Liam Smeath, um, was so furious. He was a GP and also worked at the London School of Hygiene. He was so furious that his patients were coming in and refusing to have their babies vaccinated. That led him to write an impassioned grant application to get some money to do uh, a case the first case control study that, that systematically repudiated Wakefield's um, uh, claim that this vaccine caused autism. Now, I can tell you Liam was absolutely hopping mad when he, when he wrote that application. So I'm giving you examples to say this pathos, the appeal to emotions, does not, it's not a zero sum. It, our, our scientific um, instincts, our, 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 all of our academic kind of worth can be channeled through our emotions so long as we use, um, so shall we say, those feminine academic skills of reflexivity and dialogue and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, and I think there is quite a strong uh, philosophical support for, for that argument, and you'll find it in the feminist literature. It's just everyone will be able to hear you. Basically. Okay, thank you. Um, just picking up on what you were just saying about those uh, traditionally feminine characteristics and uh, reflexivity in particular is a key aspect of qualitative research. So my question is really um, with the drive towards scientific rigour in evidence-based practice and towards um, a reliance on RCTs, have we potentially missed the emotional element of our research in the methodology that we're applying and is there a mm. role perhaps for complementary methodologies to, to fill that? Um, partly, but I don't think it's that simple and I... There's two ways of doing qualitative research. One is to do it from a philosophical paradigm that says there are some facts out there, some of them are quantitative facts and some of them are qualitative facts, and 
If you want to go and collect qualitative facts, you'd better just make sure that you get two different qualitative researchers observing the same thing and check that they observe the same facts. Um, on the other hand, if you go into the qualitative literature, you may find um, quite a, there's a big philosophical tradition around constructivism, interpretivism, that actually two researchers may well observe different things. It doesn't mean either of them are wrong. There are multiple realities. There are multiple interpretations of reality. And that's why I use the Hampstead Pond uh, example um, that, uh, you know, presumably someone would come along and, 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 and do qualitative research on the Heath and look at the tennis courts and come back with that as data. Um, it is also the case that quantitative data are, um, uh, that, that quantitative data can be collected in the constructivist framework as well, that, that the certain things that you collect, you make a choice as to whether to count those things or count those things. So the idea that anything quantitative uh, is always objective and you know, not emotionally charged um, it, it's, it's, just not, um, it's just not true. I'm just thinking of the estimates of um, people turning up for different marches, you know, the police estimates versus the demonstrators' estimates, all that kind of thing. You know, the, or Trump's the, estimates. Trump's estimates, absolutely. So, so this idea that quantitative data are always objective and qualitative are always subjective, it ain't that simple. Uh, but with that caveat, um, certainly if we reduce the definition of scientific rigor to effectively experiments measured quantitatively, then we're going to miss a heck of a lot. Yeah. And, and actually, possibly the, the most important thing when you're doing a piece of research is to make sure that you've framed the question in a way that's, in a way that's kind of scientifically acceptable, but also morally appropriate. Um, and you know I'm talking about your research, or many of your researchers. Um, yeah. Sharon. Uh, Sharon, you can post your allied health. Really great to hear that your, uh, your um, explanation of the post truth world. I was really interested in your intellectual vices versus virtue. Yeah. And I suspect there's a very narrow line in between there. I'm just wondering whether you've got any critical appraisal skills for the individual to distinguish the, the, <coughs> the vices from the virtues. Uh, I don't know, I think, I think the vices are very different from the virtues, but, but maybe the people who have inspired me as, not necessarily academics, as intellectuals, are the ones who ask the most searching questions about their own performance, their own, you know, um, they, 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 they criticise themselves, if you like, they invite criticism. The ones who stand up and say, my work is excellent, um, it must be excellent because of how important I am type thing. Yeah, that's an intellectual vice. Um, I suppose one of the things that is troubling about the way academia is going is the way, is, is the sort of metric based stuff that, you know, here we go, the league tables and how high are you in the league table, and how many papers have you published and how many this and how many that. If we're not careful, we're going to be chasing those metrics at the expense of developing and valuing the, the virtues of self-critique. Um, and actually, you, you know that critiquing one's own work and critiquing some other people's work has to be done in a psychologically safe environment. And if the environment is, if you haven't published enough Lancet papers, you're going to be out next year when your contract runs out. That's not a safe environment to start reflecting. You know, so, so there are all sorts of perverse incentives. Um, but yes, I think, I think the notion of intellectual vice is not something that's been picked up by any of the writers of all those books that, that I read to um, prepare for this. And, and I think it's an important one because it's not just that Gove is misleading people, it's that Gove is misleading people with evil motives and immoral motives and we should be standing up and saying that. And that's what I do on Twitter, you might have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly do. Other questions, Trish? Eleanor. Um, hi, Eleanor and Milligan. Just following up on, on that question of self-reflection, self so 
So in this community, we would regard ourselves as self-reflective, and we would see that as a strength. Mm -hmm. But based on what you said there, self-reflection is seen as uncertainty and weakness. So we're in this kind of catch-22, aren't we? How do we get out of it? Um, one of the ways we get out of it, we don't get out of it, one of the ways we might handle it is talk about it and um, reflect on it and I used to go to a lot of sociology conferences and there was always a stream about what is sociology's place in the universe. You know, you can, get, you can overdo this reflexivity about you know, all that kind of thing. But maybe something that, that this question comment resonates with is, is the difference between a Newtonian universe and a complex adaptive system. And in a, Newto in a Newtonian universe, everything is predictable. Um, you know, you can have an equation and an algorithm for everything. You can put the facts in at the top and turn the handle and out, com out comes the answer. In a complex system, none of the above applies. Um, things are non-linear. Things are unpredictable. Things are inherently uncertain. And the point about the uncertainty in a complex system is not just that it exists, but that nothing you do is going to resolve that uncertainty because the uncertainty is inherent. So in the old days, and according to the Newtonian paradigm, if only we did more and more randomized trials, we, we will eventually get a set of evidence that is factual, that nobody will disagree with, that, you know, that, that we will be able to sort of push into policy and, and, and all the arguments will, will stop. In a complex system, the evidence will always be contested. The evidence will always be ambiguous. It will always be incomplete. There will always be the study that should have been done but wasn't done. And we have to manage that uncertainty. Now, complex adaptive systems are characterized by tension and paradox that cannot be resolved. But it can be handled. And one of the ways that we handle tension and paradox in a complex system is through relationships and through what my colleague Wayne Parsons calls muddling through. <laughs> we, uh, we look pragmatically at the data that we've got in front of us and the problem facing it. We discuss and reflect and, you know, work with the people that we've learnt to trust while also making sure that we measure things accurately and honourably and honestly. And we just inch forward in the light of incomplete data and only partially relevant evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if we can keep talking about the fact that the world is a complex system, the world is characterized by tensions and paradox, and the Newtonian universe is, is yesterday's universe, maybe we'll get somewhere. Maybe we'll get somewhere. Trish, <coughs> having taken that, on board. How do you advise that uh, we all go about working with policymakers, so our colleagues in government, who they want a black and white answer, they don't mm. want to know about the grey, and they want an answer, you know, that's a background and everything and a solution on one page. Mm. Um, so, you know, how do we deal with the uncertainty around science? and the complexities that we've been talking about and the reflection that's very healthy. How do we deal with that when mm. um, interacting with the policy world? It's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, um, one's interactions with the policy world should be relationship-based rather than um, factual nugget-based. So rather than say, look, I've done this piece of work and I've discovered X and now how can I get X sprinkled around the policy makers? I think if that's the way you're looking at your own research and your relationship with the policy maker, it's never going to work. Um, if what you've got is an ongoing relationship with particular policy makers or particular policy units where they know that your group is doing good stuff and they possibly send one of their people to sit on your steering group for project A and you're planning project B so you have a word with them, etc., etc., all that kind of thing. So what you've got is an ongoing dialogue with your 
policymakers in a particular field, you will probably find that the research you do is influenced by your understanding of where the policymaker is coming from, you know, the, the points of departure again. So instead of doing the trial you thought was important, you actually do a slightly different trial, which is therefore going to generate um, evidence that the policymaker is going to find more helpful. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is we should stop beating policymakers up for doing what is known as satisficing. In other words, reducing the problem to something that is uh, containable that allows them to make a decision and actually take an action. You know, satisfying is a necessary part of uh, the policy process. Uh, but we should make sure that if they're going to reduce the problem to something that is many times simpler than we know it to be, what are the key things that we need to feed into their mental model? Uh, thirdly, I think we need to work much harder around our framings. <coughs> the frame reflexive awareness that Sean and Ryan talk about, and, and, and again, if you go back to the pond example, are we framing this as a leisure facility? Are we framing it as a natural feature of the environment? Now, when we are doing our research, what am I doing, but also why does it matter? Um, what, is the, what is the current policy framing of that issue? Am I going in frame or am I trying to get them to shift frame? And to be aware of those different frames. Um, and the way I would do that, the way I'd encourage people to do that is using narrative. Um, I think it's a very, very powerful, very simple, easy technique. You can all tell stories. Of course, you can get better at it. Uh, and also imagery. Imagery is very, very important. Um, so, yeah. So we have time for another question. Um, David. Yeah, yes, this is the other David, David Shum. <laughs> oh, you're the other David Shum. Oh, great. I saw your book. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the research of the Health Group. So when I was a PhD student, uh, it's not that easy to get uh, randomized control trials published go through really rigorous review and all this kind of thing. But with the proliferation of a lot of open access journals, you know, I think you know, there a lot more things are being published. And then, you know, like sometimes with PhD students and so on, they forward, right? So they look at this because it's published. It must be yes. And you know, uh, and now nowadays I see a lot of advertisements, you know, on all sorts of treatments and all that kind of thing. Mm. And they would put, you know, this is a paper published. And what 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 chance the public would have, you know, if you know yes. they think that if it's published it's good. Yes, I, I, you're absolutely right. It is getting much, much more difficult. And, you know, I first taught evidence-based medicine, as it was called then, in, in 1996. So we were just getting going in the UK teaching EBM. And then we, we thought, in 25 years' time or something, actually it will be much easier because we'll have much more evidence and everyone will have been taught critical appraisal skills. In fact, the opposite is true, and that's what, why we wrote the paper in 2014, Evidence-Based Medicine, the Movement in Crisis, because despite this extraordinarily good movement for getting good evidence, critically appraised evidence, systematic reviews, summaries, syntheses, all that, it's still harder than ever to know which to take notice of, and that's a very good example of a paradox in the complex system. So what do we do about it? One of the things we need to do is um, cultivate ourselves as credible witnesses. So actually, as Aristotle said, factor yourself in, build your social media pro profile. Um, there's been some, there's some great um, academics in the UK who now go on TV and make TV shows and they have four million viewers every week and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then if that individual is saying, look at this piece of evidence, um, we're not comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable doing that, but one, that's one thing we have to do. Uh, and then the other thing I was talking to Sheen about um, earlier is, is, is fact-checking services, fact-checking um, third sector groups that you can actually send something to or you can look on the fact-check website and they will literally fact-check a claim that has been made which is all over the newspaper uh, and they will say well, these are, this is the actual evidence behind it. Um, and of course, the, the problem is uh, there, will, there are probably fake fact check websites as well. And so it goes on and on and on. So yeah, we, we, we are, that's the world we're in. We're in the post-truth world.
awkward. <laughs> yes, we have one other question on the back. Maybe it's the last question. Um, can we ask our from I'm just thinking about the virtues and the vices. How do you sort of differentiate when epistemology or knowledge is based on the context in which the pride comes up with Jesus facts, these are the actual facts, whereas culturally another group might not appreciate that. So what is vice for one group might be virtue for another group. So how do you help when you're trying to get across what, what strategies do you use to Yes. I guess what you're saying is that many tribes do not have sophisticated intellectual skills. They, they, they are not thinking critically. They've got a narrative. They're really not sure whether it's, you know, they can't tell whether it's true or not. Um, when I gave this talk in South Africa, the scariest aspect of it was that there was lots of 13-year-old children who had won some competition to come, and then the prize was coming to this conference and listening to my talk. And I, afterwards, they took me off into a room, and it's all on, uh, on the web, actually, some on YouTube. They interviewed me about what I'd said. And talking to them over breakfast, I realized that these were very, very religious kids. They, they, they you know, church was a big thing. God was a big thing. And the framing that they used was that um, everything to do with God is, is, is right and good and moral, and everything to do with science is less so. And they said, um, what would you say if God said that these vaccines are bad? So that was the question. And I said... My God is a kind God. My God wants the little children to live and grow and play and, you know, become healthy adults. My God is not afraid of science. My God knows that good science um, will help the little children. So I kind of turned, I, in other words, I'm climbing into their frame. Um, I'm not religious, actually. <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I adopted a God for the, for the purposes of the argument <laughs> and 